The bridge over the river Ural, near the town of Orenburg in central Russia, is technically the dividing line between Europe and Asia. In September 1954, Vasily Kovalov and Ivan Skvortsov were privates in a unit of the Red Army stationed nearby. They were told to report for special maneuvers near the town of Totsk, some 50 miles away. As a young communist leader, I was given the job of organizing preparations. I had to see to it that squad personnel kept strict discipline and to check their morale because we had to carry out a very important government mission. The area had been chosen because it had some similarities with the Fulda Gap in West Germany, where Soviet forces planned to drive through NATO lines in the event of war. Everything that happened was kept secret for years. Records of who took part were suppressed, and this film was locked in the military archive until the Soviet Union collapsed. But we have found witnesses to what was an extraordinary rehearsal for nuclear war. Some of the preparations were unsurprising. Trenches had been dug across the plain, as though for an infantry battle. Tanks were left camouflaged, and aircraft positioned for takeoff. Less expected were the livestock tethered round the battlefield in the autumn sun. And this was the reason. An atomic bomb was going to be exploded over the site as part of the exercise. And the Soviet leaders wanted to find out how close a living creature could go and still survive. Military chiefs from the communist countries turned up to watch what happened from the bunker. The code word to start the exercise was Molnia, or lightning. The command came at 9 o'clock in the morning, September 14th. Enemy air attack and then atom, atomic alert, that is an atomic attack. We took to the trenches and we took cover. And for some 25 to 30 minutes, we remained in the trenches, waiting for the next signal. Атомная бомба брошена. Полет бомбы продолжался выше 40 секунд. At that point, there was a flash that blinded the men in the trench. Then the explosion took place. It was unusual. Now I'd fought in the war, and I'd seen explosions of conventional ammunition during the Second World War. But that explosion was very sharp, very abrupt. And when the explosion went off, there was a blinding lightning, so to speak, a powerful beam, a very powerful beam. We had black pieces of glass installed in our gas masks. You could hardly even see the sun through those glasses. But that light was stronger than an electric arc welder. It was a few seconds before the blast hit them. Of course, we covered our eyes with our hands, as we had been told to do. We crouched in the bottom of the trench, 
and this was followed by a sensation like an earthquake. It was as if we were on board a large seagoing ship with a ground rock. Some animals died instantly. Others survived the attack, and in that bleak sense, the experiment yielded useful data. The cloud was still rising when 40,000 troops were ordered to start their mock battle under its deadly shadow. We received the order to break cover, board the trucks, and move forward to the firing position, the site of stage two of the exercise, followed up by an attack on the enemy defensive positions. The moment we got out of the trenches, we saw a gigantic mushroom cloud rising in the distance. Then, as now, people lived and farmed in the countryside around where the exercise was held. A few days before, they'd been evacuated from their land. But they were allowed back almost before the dust had settled. When we returned, the village was still burning. There was military equipment ablaze. The fire engines were putting the fires out. Bulldozers were working away. But they actually allowed us to eat everything right away. We'd got cucumbers, tomatoes, melons in our vegetable gardens. And when we got back, all this vegetable crop was ripened. The tomatoes and such, they were all red. And they said, go ahead, you can eat everything. It's not dangerous. Of course, we and the children began eating. Forty years later, in the long grass nearby, a moth emerged from its chrysalis into the summer sun. But it will never fly. Its right wing has inherited a genetic fault from the poisoned earth around Totsk. On the surface, most of the scars have healed. Kovalyov and Skvortsov have never been back to the epicenter before. There is no official record to prove that they, or any of the other 40,000 soldiers, actually took part in the exercise. But at the local hospital in Totsk, the truth has been harder to obliterate. Despite opposition from his superiors, Dr. Nikolai Sidorov kept a record of how the local population fared. In the 1960s, there was a definite explosion of tumorous illnesses in both the region and in the whole province. I should mention here that at the end of 1991, we had 28,000 people suffering from tumorous illnesses in the province, and this trend is growing stronger every year. If we compare the statistics relating to 1950 with those for the current years, we will see that the number of cases has gone up 500%, and the mortality rate has gone up accordingly as a consequence.